We'll get started in just a couple minutes. Sure. All right, I think we're right at the hour, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, this is Marcy. I'm actually on Zoom today, so you might be hearing a little voice in the sky for me. But uh, thank you all for uh, coming to today's Tools and Technology Seminar series. Our speaker is also on Zoom today um, and remote. So if you're in the room and you have questions, you'll probably just need to speak up to get um, everyone's attention. If you are watching online today, uh, you can put your questions in the chat box. I'll be monitoring that and can let our speaker know if there are any questions that come in. Or you can uh, raise your Zoom hand using the reactions at the bottom right of your screen, and we can call on you to unmute. Um, so I don't think I have any other announcements for today. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Uh, we have Salar Fatahi, who is Assistant Professor in Department of Industrial and Operations Engineering. Um, thanks, Marcy. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my presentation. Uh, uh, thank you, Marcy, for the kind introduction and also for the invitation. Um, um, a little bit of background about me. I'm an assistant professor here at the University of Michigan in the Industrial and Operation Engineering Department. Uh, and my uh, research focus is on developing efficient algorithms and computational methods uh, for different um, practical data-driven problems uh, that, uh, first of all, are scalable, meaning that if we implement them in meaningful scale, uh, we, we, we can run it. Uh, and at the same time, they should come with some sort of proof or guarantee, meaning that if I use them, I know for sure that they will uh, converge or they will recover a desirable solution. So you can probably guess uh, that my research is sitting on the methodology side, uh, but at the same time, I'm uh, craving for some meaningful applications. And in fact, uh, this combination methodology combined with uh, meaningful application led to this research that I'm gonna be talking about today. Uh, so the title of my talk is Scalable Learning of Dynamic uh, Graphical Models uh, Beyond Maximum Likelihood Estimation. Uh, now, um, uh, before we get started, I'd like to um, um, acknowledge my collaborators. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Professor Andres Gomez from USC. Um, and our very own Professor Arvin Rao uh, from Biostatistics and uh, Computational uh, Medicine, together with two very strong PhD students, uh, Vishvesh Ravi Kumar and Tang Shu, uh, who used to be a master's student working with me, and now uh, he's a PhD student at Northwestern. Also, uh, the research is sponsored by NSF, ONR, uh, MICD, and MIDAS. Uh, now, um, before we get started, I, I just want to give you a brief overview of the structure of this talk. Uh, first, I will uh, briefly talk about uh, the general problem of uh, dynamic network inference, especially in the context of uh, biological processes. Uh, then I will talk about uh, perhaps the most uh, popular method to solve this problem, which is based on maximum likelihood estimation, or MLE, and I will also try to shed some light on its uh, shortcomings. Uh, then I will talk about our proposed method. Uh, and finally, we will see some experimental results on uh, gene expression data. 
Uh, now, um, as you probably guessed, I am by no means an expert in biology or biostatistics. Uh, so throughout my talk, uh, if you have any questions related to the methodology or the algorithm, I would be more than happy to answer. I could also try to answer your questions on the application side, but uh, I would not trust my own answers um, uh, on that front, but we'll see. All right, first, uh, um, I'm going to start with uh, some motivating applications. Um, so, so as we all know, many real world systems um, have some underlying structure that changes over time or space. In some of these problems, the underlying structure of the system is actually unknown for us. And all we have is a limited number of potentially high dimensional and randomized or noisy samples or measurements. For example, it is well known that different brain regions interact with one another in response to different physical or, or mental activities. Uh, but all we have is the fMRI data uh, that is collected from the brain. Uh, now, understanding this underlying brain connectivity network is very important, specifically for the early discovery of different uh, brain pathologies, such as Alzheimer. But this problem is very large scale. It is a huge scale problem. In fact, the full brain image, uh, I believe, has more than 200,000 voxels, uh, which implies billions of potential links uh, between these voctors or, uh, or, or uh, brain networks. Um, and this is also well known um, um, uh, that uh, the, uh, the, the underlying brain connectivity network changes with age and maturity. Uh, for example, uh, here you can see uh, uh, that the level of gray matter in the brain changes with age. So instead of learning one static connectivity network, we essentially need to learn a sequence of dynamic connectivity networks uh, that potentially changes over time to better understand the behavior of the brain uh, with age. Um, and another application is in the gene regulatory networks. Here, given the gene expression data, the goal is to infer a network that describes the correlation between different, uh, between the activity of different uh, 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 genes within each cell. Uh, but uh, similar to the brain connectivity networks, gene regulatory networks are also large scale and they change over time or space uh, in response to different environmental or physiological disorders or different diseases like cancer. Uh, for example, here on the left, uh, you can see uh, the changes in the gene regulatory network for a specific cell as the patient develops cancer. Uh, here, the first figure, figure A, uh, shows the regulatory network for a normal cell. And the last figure, figure D, shows the regulatory network for the same cell that has developed uh, breast cancer. Uh, so you can uh, uh, you can see that we can have both of these networks at different times in a single patient or even at the same time, but in different cells. Uh, in fact, we'll see an application of this later in this talk. So in all of these applications, our uh, goal is to go from the collected data or measurements to a sequence of dynamic graphical models that describe this dependency structure in the data. Now, one popular approach to do that is to use the undirected graphical models or Markov random fields, uh, where each variable is defined as a node in the graph and the correlation or dependencies between different nodes are captured by uh, weighted edges uh, in uh, the graphical model. So for example, if you have three nodes or three variables, they're modeled as three nodes in the graph. And if there is a non-zero correlation between these uh, variables, they're captured by weighted edges. In the dynamical setting, understanding this dependency structure essentially boils down to estimating a sequence of dynamic Markov random fields. For example, these Markov random fields can change spatially over space. Here you can, you can see one example, um, and for example, across different cells or over time with age, with maturity, or in response to different uh, uh, exogenous events. Now, uh, one popular method to do that is based on the so-called maximum likelihood estimation, or MLB, where the goal is to essentially find a graphical model based on which the observed data or the measurement is most probable to occur. Uh, now, if you want to also incorporate some prior or side information about the problem, such as sparsity, smoothness, or any other structure, such as uh, locality, 
uh, we can add different regularizers to the MLE per, uh, method to promote these types of structures in the estimated model. Uh, now, uh, the regularized version of the MLE approach uh, is probably one of the most commonly used inference methods for graphical models and really for, for general inference problems. Uh, so we're going to start with that. In fact, to better explain this, uh, let's consider a very well-known instance of the problem, which is the Gaussian Markov random fields. Now here we assume that the collected data is coming from a multivariate distribution that changes over time and space. And uh, now in this context, uh, the regularized MLE boils down to, the, to solving the following optimization problem. Given a bunch of samples uh, that are collected over time and space, first we find the sample covariance matrix, uh, we showed that, that with sigma uh, s and t, and then find the and then solve the following optimization problem. Right, uh, it is a minimization over a sequence of matrix variables, and the objective has four terms. The first term here uh, corresponds to the maximum likelihood estimation of the inverse covariance matrix when the samples are coming from zero mean Gaussian distribution. Now, the other three terms are regularizers that are controlled by the regularization coefficients beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3, and they have uh, the role of promoting special structures in the estimated inverse covariance matrices, uh, for example, in individual uh, parameters or individual elements or their temporal or spatial changes. Now, why do we care about the inverse covariance matrix? Well, in the Gaussian setting, um, they have a very nice interpretation. The zero non-zero elements of, of this uh, inverse covariance matrix or precision matrix at any time or, or, or uh, uh, location reveals the sparsity pattern of the uh, graphical model. And the regularization on the inverse covariance matrix actually enables us to promote uh, different structures uh, in the corresponding graphical model. For example, we know uh, many graphical models have localized or sparse structures. This can be captured with uh, an L0 regularizer in the objective. What is L0? L0 basically penalizes the number of non-zero elements in this theta or the in, uh, precision matrix. Uh, so if you have a lot of non-zero elements, the, that penalty is gonna be large. Uh, we can also add different temporal or spatial regularizations. Uh, in the MLE formulation. For example, some graphical models have a, a sparsely changing structure, meaning that only a few edges change over time or space. In that case, we can also promote sparsity with an L0 regularizer on the temporal or, or, or spatial differences of the uh, parameters. Uh, some other graphical uh, models, such as brain networks, for example, uh, they change smoothly over time. We don't have abrupt changes in the graphical model. In that case, for example, we can use L2 penalty uh, on the differences. And there are some other penalty structures that you can see here. Uh, now, let's just consider the special case of sparsely changing Gaussian Markov random fields, uh, where each inverse covariance matrix, we assume it is sparse, and it also changes sparsely over time. Um, we don't have a uh, space comp component here just for simplicity. In this case, the regularized MLE corresponds to this highly nonlinear and, in fact, combinatorial optimization problem. Uh, it is nonlinear because of this uh, strange log debt term. And uh, it is combinatorial because we are essentially optimizing over zero non zero pattern. Uh, so if you're suddenly faced with this curse of dimensionality because the search space will grow exponentially, right? Now, although these regularized MLE uh, approaches enjoy very strong statistical guarantees, uh, it is classically conjectured uh, uh, that they are very uh, hard to solve. They're intractable to solve. Now, to get rid of this combinatorial nature, the, the common approach is to basically replace L0 penalty with its L1 relaxation which is continuous and convex. This is the underlying idea behind several well-known methods uh, like lasso or graphical lasso. Uh, we can handle the combinatorial nature of L0, so we just relax it to L1 and just hope for the best, right? Uh, now, uh, with this relaxation, the, the problem becomes convex, but the issue is that uh, it will have inferior statistical guarantees, especially in the dynamical setting. Now, let's see the performance of this relaxed regularized MLE approach on a very simple case study. Suppose that here we uh, have only four time steps. 
So T is equal to four. Also, each inverse covariance matrix is 25 by 25. So it's relatively small instance. The number of non-zero elements in the inverse covariance matrix at any given time is, is we assume that it's uh, 100. That's how we design it. So they're relatively sparse. And uh, the number of changes in the in inverse covariance matrix uh, is limited to 10. So it is sparsely changing. This is an example of a sparsely changing Gaussian Markov uh, random field. So um, here on the left, uh, um, you, what you, you see is the mismatch error or the number of mistakes in the estimated parameters using the relaxed regularized ML, MLE that I just uh, mentioned. Now you can see that even with an exhaustive search over the regularization coefficients, beta one and beta two, the best mismatch error, uh, we can get a 70, meaning that the estimated matrix will uh, have 70 mistakes in its sparsity pattern. Uh, the right figure here shows the value of the non-zero elements of the true precision matrix and the estimated one at any given time. Uh, you can see that this, this red curve is the true values that we want to estimate. Uh, the, the blue curve is the, is the value that we estimate using regularized MLE. You can see that there's a huge bias in our estimation. This is because of the shrinking effect of the L1 regularizer. OK, uh, now let me give you an overview of uh, what we have seen so far. Uh, uh, as uh, we mentioned, uh, if you want to have st statistical efficiency, we typically need to solve uh, a combinatorial regularized maximum likelihood estimation. For example, if you want to impose sparsity in our model, the best choice would be regularization uh, with L1, L0 penalty. Uh, but uh, the issue is most of these uh, problems are intractable because of their uh, search space. Uh, the search space grows exponentially. So in order to get computational efficiency, we relax the regularization to arrive at a, a convex or continuous uh, regularized MLE. For example, we relax L0 to L1. Uh, but we showed that this, these methods often do not come with, with, with strong statistical guarantee. Now, our goal is to uh, introduce a method that achieves the best of both worlds. It can efficiently handle the combinatorial structure and, or the combinatorial nature of the problem without any relaxation. And at the same time, uh, we want it to come with strong statistical guarantees. Now, the key idea behind our method is to replace this MLE uh, with a more tractable optimization problem. Uh, now, before talking about the, the, our key results, uh, I just want to say a few words about the tractability of any optimization problem and its computational efficiency. Now, um, it is a conventional wisdom in optimization theory that uh, computational methods with exponential dependency in the dimension, time, memory, or data are both theoretically and practically inefficient to use and implement. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is uh, this class of methods uh, with polynomial scaling that are known to be at least theoretically efficient uh, to use. Uh, but even these so-called polynomial methods can quickly become intractable with the increasing scale of the problem. For example, regularized MLE belongs to this class. Uh, so within the realm of polynomial methods, really the only class of algorithms that are truly scalable to massive problems in genomics and brain networks with millions or billions of parameters are those that scale near linearly with respect to the dimension of the problem. So the fundamental question is, how can we design computational methods for the inference, specifically for the inference of uh, dynamic Markov random fields that are almost linear? They, they scale linearly with time, memory, and data. Now, uh, I'm going to try to summarize our key results in, in only one slide. Uh, this is probably the most important slide of my talk. So in case uh, you need to stop listening, this would be the ideal place uh, for that. The rest of my presentation will be to, uh, to clarify some of the points I'm going to make next. OK, so our first key result is that unlike the conventional wisdom, uh, we can, in fact, infer dynamic Markov random fields with exact and combinatorial L0 reg uh, regularization. Uh, not only that, we can solve this problem in near linear time and complexity. And uh, now this is very important because it basically implies that not only can we handle the curse of dimensionality or the combinatorial na nature of the problem efficiently, uh, but we also can do that uh, even more efficiently than the relaxed regularized MLE, uh, which we already know is statistically inferior. 
Okay. Now the second key, key result is that we can find the solution not only for a single sparsity level, but for all sparsity levels. This means that we can recover the entire solution path for all values of regularization coefficient. This is important in many cases uh, uh, because uh, we don't know what sparsity level we need. Uh, um, so we need to do some sort of cross-validation, for example, or BIC to find the correct sparsity level. Our result says that we can actually do this much more efficiently than just solving the problem over and over again, okay? Because we can recover the solution path. The third key uh, result uh, is on the statistical side. Uh, we show that we can actually learn dynamic Markov random field consistently, meaning with small statistical error, even if you have as few as one sample per time or location. Now, this is something that even MLE, some of the MLE-based methods cannot achieve. Um, now, um, how can we achieve this result uh, through the following optimization problem? It's a constraint optimization. Uh, our goal is to recover uh, the parameter theta st, which is the so-called canonical parameter uh, of the graphical uh, model from which the, the graph structure can be recovered. For example, for Gaussian Markov random field, this canonical pra parameter is the precision matrix. The objective is purely based on the regularization that comes from the prior or side information, such as sparsity or some specific temporal or spa uh, spatial uh, structure. The constraint here basically bounds the distance between the unknown parameter that we want to recover, the unknown uh, canonical parameter, and the so-called approximate backward mapping of the Markov random field. Now, I'm not going to talk about the exact definition of, of approximate backward mapping, but roughly speaking, it gives us a crude estimate of the parameters of the graphical model uh, that you're trying to estimate, okay? Um, um, turns out that this, this uh, 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 backward mapping can be efficiently uh, obtained directly from the data for different classes of dis distribution, such as Gaussian Markov, Markov random field. I'm, I'm gonna talk about that later. Now, let me give you two instances of this problem. Now, if we know our Markov random field changes sparsely over time, and there's, for simplicity again, there's no spatial component, uh, then we can pick L0 penalty for the functions F and G in the objective. And if we pick L0, L infinity norm as the dis distance measure for the constraint, we end up with this problem. Right. Similarly, if we uh, know that the Markov random field changes smoothly over time, uh, then we can use L2 norm for the function G. Now, the important question is, what do we gain by going from this regularized MLE to this constraint optimization problem? It seems that we still uh, have the combinatorial nature of the problem because you have L0 norm everywhere. Next, I'm going to show you that, in fact, this new optimization framework can outperform regularized MLE, both in terms of the computation and statistical guarantees, okay? Now, before talking about these results or these guarantees, well, uh, let's consider the same small case study that I showed before. Just as a recap, uh, we, we generated 25 by 25 inverse covariance matrices that are changing sparsely over time. Now, our goal is to recover these inverse covariance matrices uh, with our proposed method, uh, here on the left, you can see the mismatch error for our proposed method compared to the regularized MLE for different levels of approximation error in the backward mapping. Uh, you can see that our method, in fact, leads to zero mismatch error. It does not make any mistake for a wide range of approximation levels in the uh, sample covariance matrix, whereas the regularized MLE always has a non-zero mismatch error, even if there is no error in the available sample covariance. Now, uh, the second figure is more interesting. Uh, here it shows the non-zero elements of the true and the estimated signals. The blue curve, as I mentioned, is the estimated signal using the, the, the regularized MLE, uh, which we have seen before. The estimated signal using our method is shown in green. And as you can see, it is very close to the true uh, uh, solution or the true uh, non-zero values that we are trying to recover. Now, based on this case study, I hope I could at least convince you that um, our proposed method can potentially be a better choice for the inference of dynamic uh, graphical models.
Now, uh, to streamline my presentation in, uh, in the rest of my talk, I'm just going to uh, focus on the sparsely changing Gaussian Markov random field. So we assume that the Markov random field changes sparsely over time. So there is no spatial component for now. And the underlying distribution is Gaussian. I should also mention that our results um, uh, can be extended to more general uh, setting when we have both uh, changes in both space and time. Uh, and it can also be extended to more general distributions beyond Gaussian Markov random fields, for example, discrete Markov random fields. But we, we, we're not going to talk about those cases here. Uh, I would be more than happy to discuss them uh, offline. And towards the end, I'm going to give you some references uh, that uh, have these extensions. Okay. So as I, uh, is there any question? All right. Uh, so, um, uh, as I mentioned here, we consider this uh, sparsely changing Markov random fields with uh, Gaussian distribution. So our canonical parameter is the precision matrix and the functions F and G are L0 penalties to promote sparsity in the individual parameters and their differences. And the distance uh, uh, from the approximate backward mapping is measured with respect to the L infinity norm. Okay, now, as you can see, our entire optimization framework relies on the avail availability of this approximate backward mapping. Now, the question is, how can we find this approximate backward mapping? In the Gaussian setting, a recent work actually proposed to use the inverse of a soft thresholded version of the sample covariance matrix as the backward mapping. Okay, uh, so the idea here is that given uh, the samples, First, we find the sample covariance matrix. This is, this is going to be a dense and potentially low rank matrix uh, if the number of measurements is not sufficiently large. And then we soft threshold the off diagonal entries at some level. Okay, The resultant matrix is going to be sparse, uh, but probably full rank. And finally, take the inverse of this thresholded matrix. This is going to be our approximate backward mapping. Now, the interesting thing here is that we can actually drive very strong statistical guarantees for our proposed estimation method, assuming that we can solve it efficiently using the simple backward mapping. Okay. In particular, suppose that the number of available samples at each time, uh, which we show it with uh, NT, scales logarithmically with D. D is the size of the matrix, the precision matrix. It's D by D, and also logarithmically with T. Then uh, um, if the, the other parameters of the problem satisfy certain properties, then we can show that with high probability, we will recover the, the correct sparsity pattern of the inverse covariance matrix and their differences, and we're gonna have small estimation error. And the estimation error uh, decays at the rate of one over square root of n, nt. Okay, so roughly speaking, this theorem basically implies that the estimated inverse covariance matrix uh, that we get by solving this optimization problem, uh, it's going to have correct sparsity pattern and uh, small estimation error, provided that the number of samples at any given time scales logarithmically with the dimension of the problem. Now, this implies that even if the dimension of the unknown uh, parameters, in this case, the dimension of the precision matrix, is significantly larger than the number of samples, we can still recover the true solution with high probability and with strong uh, statistical guarantees. Now, this is a strong uh, re result to some extent, uh, but it has an important limitation. It requires multiple samples at uh, each time step. Right? The theory says that we need to have at least a logarithmic number of samples at any given time. But uh, in many cases, in many applications, we may only have one sample per time, right? Uh, while the underlying graph continues to change with the incoming data. Uh, so uh, we may have uh, as few uh, as one sample per time uh, for, the, for the underlying Markov random field. Uh, so we ask this somewhat um, ambitious question. Can we learn the time varying Markov random field with as few as uh, one sample per time? And uh, uh, turns out that the answer to, to this question is yes. And the key idea is to use kernel average. Okay. Uh, the main intuition here is that if the uh, if the underlying Markov random field changes sl slowly over time, then the past observed samples can still probably reveal some information 
about the, the structure of the Markov random field at the present time, because they are probably co collected from different but very similar distributions. Okay, now I'm going to explain this intuition with some graphs. Our previous theorem basically said that if uh, if the data arrives in batches, okay, uh, uh, we can we can uh, recover uh, the true solution uh, if you have multiple samples uh, at any given time, um, and uh, we can recover the 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 the, 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 uh, the precision matrix based on these samples. On the other hand, in uh, different settings. Uh, the data may arrive sequentially or one at a time, and each sample may correspond to, uh, for example, different distributions, right? Here, the idea is to consider a weighted average of, of uh, these samples uh, where the weights are coming from a kernel that essentially assigns different weights uh, to different samples. Uh, so if you're at time t, for example, uh, the, the samples closer to time t will have a higher weight uh, than the ones that are far away from time t, okay? Now, using this approach, the, the sample covariance matrix corresponds to this uh, weighted average of the samples where the weights are coming from a kernel. I just, uh, I just described that kernel. Here, h, the parameter h, is uh, a, par a parameter that controls the bandwidth of the kernel. It is chosen based on the rate of change in the Markov random field. For example, if uh, we know that, it is, that the Markov random uh, field changes slowly, then we can pick a large value for, for this bandwidth. Uh, and the, if we pick a large value for this bandwidth, uh, the weights will be more uh, evenly spread out across time. Now, it turns out uh, that here, uh, we can use the same backward mapping uh, that we saw before, except that here we assume uh, we, uh, we use this thresholding uh, instead of uh, the sample covariance matrix on the weighted average that I uh, mentioned above. Uh, with this modification, we show that even if we have as few as one sample per time, we can still correctly recover the sparsity pattern of the inverse covariance matrices and their differences under some conditions. Okay, uh, now uh, we're done with the statistical guarantees uh, for uh, the proposed inference method, but uh, we still haven't explained how we can solve this problem uh, efficiently in practice, right? Uh, uh, before moving on, I just want to make sure that there is, there is no question. All right, so let's move on. Now, let's go back to the, the, the original problem that we introduced uh, for the sparsely changing uh, Markov random fields. Uh, now, the first and perhaps the most uh, important thing to note here in this optimization problem is that, in fact, this, this problem can be fully decomposed over different coordinates of the unknown parameters. Now, our constraint here is the element-wise maximum. It's, it's the L infinity norm, which is the element-wise maximum of the differences which is essentially equivalent to d squared number of uh, linear inequalities over different elements of the precision matrix. You can reformulate this maximum into individual linear inequalities. Now, why is it important? Because it leads to a fully decomposed uh, optimization problem over different coordinates of the precision matrix. For example, suppose that uh, we need to estimate this precision matrix uh, corresponding uh, to three uh, different times. If you try to estimate it using MLE, uh, for example, uh, all these uh, unknown elements are going to be coupled together because uh, MLE is not really decomposable. Our method naturally decomposes into different subproblems, each defined on uh, an individual coordinate of the precision matrix. For example, here, to estimate the first coordinate, uh, in the first row of the precision matrix, we only need to solve an, uh, 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 an optimization problem or an optimization subproblem defined over the blue entries. Uh, now, more rigorously, each of these subproblems uh, look like this. Uh, for every uh, component i and j, we need to solve an optimization problem in this form that is coupled only in time. It's not coupled over different coordinates. It's only uh, coupled in time. Here, the function i is just the indicator function. It takes the value 1 if uh, the ij element of theta t 
is non-zero and it takes zero otherwise. And the constraint is just a simple lower and upper bound on the parameter. Um, now, to recover the full precision matrix, we need to solve d squared uh, number of subproblems in this form. Now, what are the implications of this decomposition? Well, the first implication is that we need to solve significantly smaller subproblems. Each subproblem is going to be defined only over t variables. t is the length of the time. Uh, the other implication is that the overall complexity becomes linear in the size of the pre precision matrix. Why is it linear? Remember, the size of the matrix, size of the precision matrix is, is two, uh, d squared right, d by d matrix. Uh, and we have, in this case, we have d squared number of variables. This is very useful since in many cases, the size of the precision matrix is very large. Uh, the other very important implication is on the implementation side. Based on this decomposition, our proposed optimization can be easily parallelized. This is very important uh, because most of the regularized MLE approaches are not amenable uh, to, uh, to parallelization. Uh, We're gonna see the benefit of this parallelization later in our numerical study. Now, um, we still haven't answered one question. How can we solve each subproblem efficiently? Now, each subproblem, as you can see here, is still combinatorial, right? We have indicator functions. So in principle, we may still face with this curse of dimensionality in each of these subproblems. But it turns out that we can actually do much better than that. Now I'm gonna to try to explain this, this algorithm that we came up with through uh, 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 different steps. Let's start with a special case where uh, this beta coefficient is equal to one. This means that we only care about the sparsity in the parameter differences. So we do not penalize uh, the non-zero elements in the individual parameters. In this case, um, it turns out that uh, a simple greedy algorithm actually can give us an optimal solution. The idea is the following. At time t equal to zero, at the initial time, we look into the future and find the longest sequence of non-empty overlapping feasible intervals. So each of these problems have a lower bound and upper bound. They, they define a feasible interval. We look at the non-empty overlapping feasible interval. Then we set the variables uh, within that range uh, to an arbitrary value from that non-empty non overlapping interval, and we do the same process for the rest of the variables. Uh, now, uh, here's a toy example. Suppose that these are segments uh, that show the upper bound and lower bounds for different uh, feasible intervals at different times. X-axis is the time, Y-axis is the value of these feasible intervals. Using our greedy algorithm, First, we find the longest non-empty overlapping interval, which is this blue box uh, in this figure. Then we set the variables from time zero to time five to any arbitrary value from this interval. After this, we inevitably have a change in our variables because we we we, we don't have a non uh, 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 we don't have an overlapping interval, and we incur a cost for that. But then we do the same process. You just find a non-empty overlapping interval and set the variables accordingly. Now we can show that this very simple and very greedy algorithm uh, can in fact give us the optimal solution for this special case where beta is equal to one, okay? Now the situation is very different in the general case where beta is strictly between zero and one. Now in this case, um, um, uh, we want to promote sparsity in both the parameters the precision matrix and their temporal differences. Not only do we want to have as few changes as possible, but also uh, uh, we want to, uh, to set the variables to zero as much as possible. Now, clearly, if we uh, uh, have a non if, if zero is not uh, a feasible solution, uh, we can uh, just use a greedy algorithm, right? Because we don't have a zero feasible solution. As soon as we see a zero, uh, a, a feasible zero in these intervals, we need to choose between two options. First, we can just ignore this feasible zero and just stick with our greedy algorithm just to avoid paying a penalty uh, for changing the value of the uh, variable. But note that here we incur a cost for the non-zero elements. The other option is to switch to zero incur the cost of switching, but instead avoid paying the penalty for the non-zero elements. Uh, now, um, if you take the first approach or first option in this case, the total cost is gonna be 10 times one minus beta. If we take the second approach, 
the cost will be six times one minus beta plus beta. Now, a simple calculation uh, would uh, show that the optimal solution is to switch to zero um, only if the, the beta is less than four fifth. Now, this intuitively makes sense uh, because if beta is small, that means that we put more weight, according to your objective, we put more weight on the non-zero elements. So having a non-zero element uh, is more costly uh, than a change in our variables. Okay, now uh, this intuition would imply the following possible algorithm, right? We, we use greedy algorithm as long as zero is not feasible. As soon as we see a, a feasible zero, we take one of these uh, options. If beta is large, meaning that we have small penalty for non-zero elements, we stick with our greedy algorithm. We don't switch to zero because uh, the cost of switching is too high. If beta is small, then the cost of having non-zero elements is uh, very high, uh, so we would want to switch to zero. Now, the question is, uh, does this algorithm give us the optimal solution? Perhaps surprisingly, the answer is no. Now, there is a contraexample for this intuitive uh, uh, algorithm, which I'm not going to discuss because of the time. Instead, I'm going to talk about the, the, the optimal algorithm, okay, for a general case where beta is between zero and one. Turns out, the correct way to solve this optim uh, to, to solve this optimization problem is to cast it as a shortest path problem over a directed acyclic graph or uh, or a, a DAG. Let me explain this algorithm with a simple example. Suppose that the feasible intervals are in this form. Uh, first, we find the maximal zero sequences in these intervals. So, for example, here we have three zero sequences or zeros that are feasible. We map them to three different nodes in the graph. So uh, each feasible uh, zero interval is going to be uh, a, a node in our graph. We also add a source and sync node. These are going to be the nodes in our graph. Next, we connect the source to the first node corresponding to the first zero sequence, and we assign a weight to this edge. Then this, this, this edge uh, uh, comes from the previous greedy algorithm that I mentioned. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to talk about details of, of this uh, construction, but turns out um, uh, the, the resulted graph is going to be uh, a weighted, complete, uh, directed acyclic graph. Now, the reason why we construct this synthetically generated graph is because it turns out that the optimal cost for the problem that I mentioned for general beta between zero, 0 and 1 corresponds the shortest path between the source and the sink in this new graph, and which can be solved very efficiently using a dynamic programming. Okay. Now, uh, uh, finally, we can put all these pieces together, and uh, we can we can uh, solve the, the original optimization problem that I mentioned, and we can recover the precision matrix. Now, I'm not going to talk about different steps together, but I'm going to mention the last result, which is the computational guarantee. Turns out that the proposed method uh, or all these steps can be done uh, in um, a time and memory complexity that scales with d squared times t, which is exactly the number of uh, variables in the problem. Remember, e at each time, the precision matrix is d by d, so we have d squared number of variables, and we have t different times. So the total number of variables is going to be d squared times t, which means that the complexity of solving this problem scales linearly with the number of unknown uh, variables or unknown parameters. This is exactly what we wanted. All right. Now, for the rest of my talk, I'm just going to give you some, some uh, experimental results. Uh, now, in our first case study, we consider a randomly generated massive data set. Here, the data is collected from a Gaussian distribution with a sparsely changing inverse covariance matrix. Uh, now, here on the left figure, uh, you, saw, you, 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 you see the runtime of uh, our algorithm as a function of the total number of variables, which is equal to d squared times t. You can see that the runtime is almost linear with respect to the number of variables, which verifies our theorem. Uh, using our method, we could solve instances uh, of the problem with more than 5 million variables in less than one hour on a normal laptop computer. The regularized MLE in this scale cannot even start running the, uh, running the algorithm. Okay, And the right uh, figure shows a statistical consistency. Uh, and we get, as we increase the number of variables, uh, we get close to 100% sparsity accuracy. 
Okay. Now the next slide shows the performance of our algorithm after parallelization. Remember, our algorithm is amenable to uh, parallelization uh, because of this element-wise decomposability. Using five cores, we could reduce the runtime of our algorithm by 40% on average. But beyond that, increasing the number of uh, cores does not really significantly reduce the runtime. In fact, it may lead to some memory issues, uh, uh, which I'm not going to discuss here. Now, our next case study will be on gene expression data. I mentioned at the beginning of my talk uh, 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 that here our goal is to understand the underlying uh, 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 gene regulatory network given the gene expression data and uh, the gene regulatory network can be used to identify different uh, regulatory interactions between genes, uh, which can probably uh, help us better understand different disease processes uh, like uh, cancer in a macro level rather than individual gene levels. Uh, here, uh, we collect the data from a glioblastoma tissue uh, of uh, a patient here uh, uh, in Michigan Medicine. The data is collected uh, in Michigan Medicine, and the data is pulled from two adjacent tissues, and the expression data is obtained from 25 100 most variable genes. And then through a 3D, fancy 3D embedding of the data, which I'm not an expert in, uh, we could cluster uh, the data in five different parts or regions. Uh, you can see these clusters here with different colors. Each cluster will be modeled as an individual Markov random field. Now, the important thing that I need to mention uh, here is that um, unlike the previous case study, here the data does not have a temporal component. And instead, it is spatially varying. So these five different Markov random fields are spatially correlated to each other rather than temporal correlation. But our method can be extended to this case as well. Now, um, next thing I want to mention is the parameter tuning. Uh, now, there are different parameters that we need to fine tune, obviously, based on the available data. For example, how do we pick the regularization coefficient, right, in the objective, or really other uh, parameters in, in the in the proposed method? Now, to fine tune the regular uh, regularization coefficient, the objective, we make them proportional to their spatial and expression distance. So, uh, if, for example, two clusters are close spatially, the regularization coefficient between these two clusters will be large because we want to encourage more similarity in their learned networks. Uh, uh, there are also other parameters that we need to uh, fine tune. Uh, for example, we need to set the upper bound and lower bound on the constraint of our problem. Uh, and we set these parameters based on BIC criteria. We, we just uh, try different values, estimate the network and measure their likelihood, and then pick the one that gives us the highest likelihood, okay? Uh, this was a brief overview of, the, uh, of how we set the parameters. Now, I should also mention that the gene expression data is not Gaussian. It is known to have a negative binomial distribution. Now, to use this Gaussian Markov uh, random field, we need to use this non-paranormal transformation to change the distribution of data to Gaussian. Now, next, I'm going to talk about, very briefly, talk about the, the results. Now, unfortunately, I can't really show the inferred networks in each cluster because they're big networks. What I show instead is the 15 strongest edges in each cluster for the inferred network, and the node sizes here uh, are scaled uh, with their degree. So larger nodes means that they have a higher degree. Uh, based on these graphs, you can easily see that the different clusters have uh, really distinct regulatory interactions uh, that are really different from, uh, uh, from uh, each other. In fact, if you look at the number of edges in different clusters, uh, uh, you can see that they are drastically different. Some of the clusters are super sparse. For example, cluster 3 has only 446 edges. Recall that our uh, uh, the each cluster has, has 2,500 uh, nodes. Another cluster um, has close to 14,000 edges. This shows that uh, 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 the, the, the inferred networks are heterogeneous, um, but you also have some level of sparsity that are coming from the spatial regularization. Uh, here you can see the heat map uh, of the similarity between different inferred networks in different clusters, uh, you can see that some of these clusters have some level of similarities. For example, here, cluster one and three have similarity degree of 0 0.3. A similarity degree of one basically means that they're exactly identical. Uh, now, I uh, 
I also want to mention uh, that our results are biologically meaningful. Here you can see the interactions between the transcription factors in, in our inferred network. If I understand correctly, uh, these uh, transcription factors are proteins that play an important role in the evolution of the cancer. Uh, here are the interactions among the most uh, important transcription factors in different clusters based on their inferred networks. Some of these factors clearly stand out, right? Uh, since they are, uh, they have large degree. Interestingly, these are exactly the transcription factors that are that, that are known to play a key role in the glioblastoma uh, cancer, which was a subject of our study. All right, now uh, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to conclude my talk. Uh, as I mentioned, the main goal of this talk was to infer large scale um, dynamic Markov random fields with strong statistical and computational guarantees. That was our goal. Uh, we developed a scalable inference method uh, for dynamic Markov random fields for the inference of dynamic Markov random fields are under different side information, such as sparsity and uh, other temporal or spatial structures. And in practice, we show that they, they, they can, we can solve uh, different instances of the problem. Uh, in fact, instances with more than 500 million variables in less than one hour. And we also talked about an important application of this problem in gene regulatory networks. Now, here are the references. Uh, this talk was mainly based on the first two papers that I mentioned. Uh, the part that I didn't talk about was this, the spatial component uh, uh, and, and other distributions. Those, those are based on the, the last, the, the, the bottom two papers. One of them is published, the other one is under preparation. Uh, now I'm gonna stop here and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Slar. We can give you a round of applause. Thank you. Um, so Thank does you. anyone have any questions? If you're in the room, uh, you can ask. So far, there have been no questions uh, online, but if you're online, you've got questions, you can put them in the chat box. Um, we can read them out or raise your Zoom hand and we can call to unmute you. And again, if you guys, if there are any questions in the room, uh, feel free to ask. So we'll just give it a couple of minutes just in case anyone online is sure. typing. Well, I'm not seeing or hearing any questions. And Solar, I know that you have uh, another meeting that you need to get to, so I don't want to yes. keep you um, uh, extra long or anything. Th thanks again. Thanks uh, everyone for attending the talk. And uh, thanks Marcy for the invitation. Um, okay. And yeah. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks everyone for coming and hopefully I'll see everyone at next week's presentation. Bye. -bye.